Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Webster, the Helen and Henry Posner, Junior Dean of University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon. And it's my very great honour to welcome you to tonight's event, Fine and Rare 4, Inside CMU Libraries Special Collections. I'm glad to acknowledge amongst our audience, CMU faculty, staff, students and friends of the library, members of our Board of Trustees and members of my Dean's Advocacy Council. As Dean of Libraries, I'm often asked three questions. Firstly, do we still need libraries now that we've got Google? I could spend four hours debating the answer. Let me just say yes. The second most frequent question, which has just been answered, is why on earth do you let Sam handle precious works with his bare hands? And thirdly, when are we going to have the next fine and rare? There really is a huge amount of interest and demand for Sam's wonderful presentations, and we're so pleased to have him with us again this evening. I'm conscious that we gather on Burns Night. Robert Burns was born 265 years ago today, and for Scots, for those who enjoy Scottish culture, and perhaps especially those who enjoy Scotch whisky, this is an important day. There are celebrations around the world. I, I checked just before coming online and the Beijing Scottish Society had its Burns Night party last Saturday. I don't mention this out of sentiment or a desire to go and put on a kilt or anything like that, but because Andrew Carnegie was a lifelong admirer of Robert Burns. In fact, according to his autobiography, the first penny he ever earned was one from his school teacher, Mr. Martin, for reciting to his class the Barnes poem, Man Was Made to Mourn. A claim can be found in various publications that Andrew Carnegie wanted a bust of Barnes to be placed in each of the more than two and a half thousand libraries that he funded. It's a wonderful story, but I'm pretty sure it's a myth. Um, busts of Barnes do not adorn the many libraries around the world. But we do know that he was keen to immortalise his favourite poet in his first American hometown, Pittsburgh, of course. And he asked for Barnes' name to be carved on the facade of the uh, main library in Oakland alongside those of Bach and Beethoven and Goethe and others. Alas, the building committee overruled his wish, saying that Barnes wasn't famous enough. He was disappointed, but instead he raised a monument to Barnes in Shenley Park, near Phipps Conservatory, which he unveiled in 1914 during his last visit to Pittsburgh. A bit of a cultural deviation, um, which I'm grateful for your indulgence. But here at Carnegie Mellon, our special collections is envisaged as an interdisciplinary workshop where humanistic modes of inquiry combine with innovative tools to allow us to study historical technologies, books and artefacts. Our diverse and valuable collections fuel transformative exhibitions, groundbreaking research, and other programs that bring students, scholars, and members of the public into special collections and into our libraries. We've built a strong community of friends and scholars, and I'm grateful to all who have supported our work by engaging with our collections, attending our events, and funding our significant acquisitions. During tonight's event, many of the items that you will see wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of you, our community, and we really are grateful to you. If this is your first time joining us, welcome to Fine and Rare. Many people in the university libraries have been working to bring this and our other collections-focused events to you. I'm particularly grateful to Sonia Wellington, our events manager, who looked after all of the logistics for this evening's event. And I also acknowledge our entire external relations team. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, our curator of special collections, Dr. Sam Lemley. Dr. Lemley oversees special collections and has responsible for their continued development, as well as teaching with the collections and leading their use in research and scholarship. Sam gained his PhD in English Literature at the University of Virginia, and he also has a Master's in Library Information Science with a Certificate in Rare Book and Special Collections Librarianship. He's held research fellowships at the Houghton Library at Harvard, at Princeton, the Dibner Library of the History of Science and Technology, and the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. 
Sam also is the editor of a forthcoming book featuring essays by leading scholars of Shakespeare and print. I'll use that to remind you that Sam's exhibition of our seven Shakespeare folios remains open for public visit at the Frick for another few weeks. If you enjoy this event, please consider supporting the libraries with a gift to our acquisitions fund. Your donations fund acquisitions that make possible the many exhibitions, research programs, and classroom sessions that bring the community into our special collections. Thank you again for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Sam Lendley. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Lemley, Curator of Special Collections in Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Welcome to this next installment of Fine and Rare. Tonight, we're going to go back to what I did in one of the earlier uh, installments, which is look at some of the recent acquisitions I've been bringing into the collection, either by purchase or by gift. Um, and I really like doing this um, with as broad an audience as possible because a lot of this happens sort of behind the scenes, but I think people really get excited when they get the chance to see how a collection like Special Collections grows and evolves um, with a few criteria about what we collect and why. Um, so as I mentioned in that earlier installment, uh, the focus of the collection is really becoming uh, the history of technology and more specifically the long history of computing, computational thought, cryptography, robotics, artificial intelligence, kind of reflecting the culture and curricular focus of CMU. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a really, really deep past to each of those fields. Uh, and it, it sort of leads that past, that history leads into really surprising and unexpected direction. So tonight we're going to look at some of those. Uh, we'll, hear, we'll hear some familiar names, um, some new ones, uh, but we're going to cross cultures, cross centuries, and uh, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and I hope you enjoy. So this first object is a book. It's an issue of an academic journal that was printed in 1720. And it contains uh, the German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz's um, study of binary arithmetic or binary code. Um, so Leibniz is probably a fairly well-known name to this audience. Uh, he's an incredibly important figure in the history of mathematics. He's known for independently discovering calculus along with Isaac Newton, for instance. Um, but he also devised um, early calculating devices, one that was capable of um, all four arithmetic operations, and another, which is more kind of uh, topical given the, the, what's in front of me, he also developed a machine that operated on binary principles of arithmetic. Um, that one was less successful um, than the uh, standards sort of decimal arithmetic, uh, arithmetic machine. Um, but we know that he was working on a binary device in the 1670s. Um, so, but, but this is a really important moment um, in the history of mathematics uh, and really is the mathematical foundation of modern computer science, given that Leibniz's system of binary enumeration is the system that more or less we rely on uh, in all of our you know, computers today. Um, so uh, the, he, Leibniz wasn't the first to experiment with binary arithmetic or binary systems. Um, the French mathematician Blaise Pascal had discussed it, uh, English mathematician Thomas Harriot, uh, and also Francis Bacon, who's a very well-known name in the history of science. He had proposed a system of cryptography uh, that used two letters, A and B, uh, to disguise you know, any any message right that was that was encoded using an alphabet um, so uh, but I think what Leibniz did uh, was recognize the real potential in binary systems uh, and that's what he does in this treatise in particular he points out that yes it can be used to replace a decimal system for you know calculation um, it can also be used as a cryptographic system but more broadly much more expansively Leibniz suggested that binary code, one and zero, um, could function as a universal symbolic language. So you could take any kind of information 
and represent it as ones and zeros. And of course, we know that that's a, an incredibly important idea uh, in the history of um, computation. Um, so we'll we'll look through this. Uh, it's kind of surprising how short it is. Um, as I said, this. Uh, copy of this edition was printed in 1720. This work actually first appeared in 1703, um, so it was reprinted um, 15 years later. Um, but if you page through, it's quite short. Uh, and on the first page, the overleaf, um, you have this table that shows the binary values of you know, decimal um, digits. Um, so 1 being 1, 2, 1, 0, 3, 1, 1. Um, and for those of you that have studied computer science or binary enumeration will know that that is the system that, that we still use today. Um, but you know, needless to say, uh, Leibniz is, as I've said, incredibly important in the history of computational thought. Um, and it's really exciting that we acquired this, I acquired it about a month and a half ago, uh, so really recently. But it's exciting that we have this because we also have in the Posner Memorial Collection a copy of Leibniz's uh, first edition of Leibniz's Calculus, right? I think 1684. And we also, which I shared in an earlier installment uh, of Fine and Rare, we have a replica of that um, calculating machine uh, that I discussed earlier. Um, so we really now have, with the acquisition of this book, all of the major contributions by Leibniz to the history of computing. And that just goes to show, you know, the theme of tonight is how is the collection growing? How does it evolve? That goes to show, like, what what I, what I look for when I'm looking for things to acquire, you know, what do we have, what gaps are there to fill, uh, and how can we go about forming a collection that tells as full a story as possible of the history of computing. Um, so that's a great place to start. Okay, so this next object is a portrait. Um, and it might appear as though it's an engraving on paper, um, but it's actually woven in silk. Um, and that's important given its subject. This is a portrait of Joseph Marie Jacquard, who was the inventor of the programmable loom and was the first to use punched cards um, actually to control a machine, uh, a loom. And uh, you can see here in the portrait, I'll just describe it briefly. He's sitting um, at a desk on an upholstered chair and the upholstery on the chair was probably made using one of his looms. Um, and then if you look closely on the desk, he actually has kind of a sheaf of punched cards, which would have been made out of a cardstock kind of paper material. Um, he's using a pair of calipers to actually check the position of the holes that are punched into the cards. Um, and then just to the left of that, um, off the frame from his sort of right hand, is the attachment, a model of the attachment that would have been put on the loom that would sort of feed the punch cards through. Um, so Jacquard, uh, we just talked about Leibniz and binary systems. Jacquard is incredibly important, like Leibniz in the history of computing, um, for his innovation of sort of punch card, punch card programming. Um, and the way that it worked, you know, it's really hard to explain without a video, you know, actually seeing the inner, working, inner workings of the loom. Uh, but each punch card, when it would sort of enter the attachment, um, a hole would let through a little hook, which would then raise um, a thread in the pattern of the textile. Or if there was no hole, it wouldn't be raised and the thread would remain flat. So if you have the right pattern punched into each punched card, uh, and you go through tens of thousands of them, usually in one design, uh, you end up with very intricate um, patterns in the final woven product. Um, but the important point is that it was a binary system, whether on or off, up or down, one or zero. Um, and of course, that ended up being incredibly influential uh, for early uh, com computation and computers. Um, but this image, uh, it, this, this object is very rare. Um, I acquired it about six months ago for the collection. Um, and it's interesting because there's a copy, if you can call it a copy, in the Library of Congress. But the Library of Congress's copy is significantly smaller. So their copy, I think, is 59 centimeters in height. Ours is almost 85 centimeters in height. Um, so that, to me, suggests that the size um, of the image could be adjusted on the loom depending on what the customer wanted. 
Um, but it also means that our copy at CMU is incredibly important. And I like to brag about that fact, of course, as the curator, right? We have the, the, bigger, the bigger copy of the two. Um, but the image itself is, is really fascinating. I've done some work on it, some research on it. I think there's a lot of symbolism in it that I'm missing. Um, but I'll just point out a couple things first. So the window, which is again, sort of off uh, Jacquard's right hand in the portrait, uh, you can sort of see um, a hazy image of a city through the glass. Uh, but you also notice there's a small hole um, that's basically the size of um, you know, a bullet. Uh, and uh, the, the thinking is, and this is kind of historical speculation, but I, I do think there's some symbolism here. The thinking is that Jacquard, in automating fine uh, weaving, put a lot of very skilled laborers out of work. Uh, and the, the laborers who were put out of work might have resorted to violence against you know, the, the loom operators, loom owners, and even Jacquard himself as the inventor of this technology. So that just goes to show that the concerns around automation and automating work um, go back centuries. Um, I don't think I mentioned when this was made, but this was um, printed or woven in 1839, so five years after Jacquard had died in 1834. Um, but these concerns, as I say, are, were very much alive even at the time. Um, so as I mentioned, the punched card as a technology uh, was, of course, immensely influential and important in the history of computing. Um, so sort of at the same time as Jacquard, uh, the English mathematician Charles Babbage uh, was working on developing his analytic engine, which is an early mechanical calculator computer. Um, and he recognized the potential in using punched cards to actually program mathematical operations into the analytic engine. Uh, but more famously and more importantly, um, Ada Lovelace, who worked with Charles Babbage, uh, recognized the potential in representing really high level mathematics um, using binary systems and on punch cards. And there's this um, really wonderful quote from Lovelace where she says, you know, on the Jacquard loom, uh, punch cards were used to weave flowers and other decorative patterns, but placed inside a analytic engine or other computational device, um, punch cards could weave algebraic uh, equations, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, going forward in time, at the turn of the last century, you have people like Her Herman Hollerith, who used uh, punch cards to uh, run statistical analysis of census data. Uh, and that's important because he ended up uh, forming a company. Uh, I think it was a tabulating uh, machine company, uh, again, around the turn of the century, that would ultimately evolve to become IBM. So you can sort of trace this fascinating um, genealogy um, from Jacquard, from Looms, uh, programmed with punch cards, all the way to the explosion of business computing um, in you know, the 19th, 1900s, uh, 1950s. Um, so it's, and it's, it's just a beautiful image in its own right. I mean, the, the level of detail that you could accomplish with this technology is really stunning. Um, I've read that this image, uh, would have taken something like 24,000 individually punched cards. So just a staggering number of cards that would have run through the machine sort of on a chain. Um, and I think it's really amazing that the, uh, inscription, the title, uh, is also woven. So you can kind of think of this as another ancestor um, of writing machines, right? Even, even sort of large language models like ChatGPT, right? So a machine is actually producing uh, text, uh, textual language. Um, and I, I, I also like to point out about this artifact that it's kind of fitting that we have it at CMU because Andrew Carnegie, when he was young in Scotland, his father was actually a weaver and would have used a jacquard loom uh, that was based on the designs of jacquard. So there's, again, sort of come homecoming. You know, all of it is sort of connected. Um, and I think this object, having this in special collections, is, allows us to tell all of those stories to students and researchers. So this next book is this little handheld volume. It's actually in two volumes. This is the uh, second volume. Uh, it's a collection of letters written by Mary Wortley Montague, who was an English noblewoman. Uh, she spent a couple years in Turkey, in Constantinople, 
at the Ottoman court uh, when her husband was appointed as a sort of ambassador uh, for England to the Ottoman court. Um, and she was there sort of from 1716 to 1718. And during her time, she wrote a series of letters back to her family, friends, and acquaintances, sort of with her observations um, uh, of Turkish culture. Um, they were incredibly popular. Uh, this is a second printing, uh, 1763, the year after she died. Uh, but the first edition actually appeared in that same year. So that gives you an idea of how well uh, these sold. They sold out within a year and they were reprinted. Um, so she was really an interesting uh, character in her own right. She was sort of a radical and progressive at the time. Um, she taught herself Latin, uh, sort of going against her father who believed she didn't need to be educated, being a girl, being a woman. Um, but she taught herself uh, Latin and a number of other things um, and she married sort of against the wishes of her family. Um, and uh, another way that she was fairly radical, actually, when she was in uh, Turkey, um, she had her children inoculated against smallpox, which is widely practiced um, in the East, but was viewed with sort of profound skepticism by the medical establishment in the West. And then when she returned to England, um, she really uh, pushed for uh, England to adopt inoculation to really combat smallpox, which was at the time an incredibly lethal uh, an infectious disease. Um, but that might raise the question, okay, so she's this fascinating person, she wrote all these letters, um, it's kind of an interesting ethnographic um, object in its own right, but what place does, you know, Montague have in a collection that tells the history of cryptography, mathematics, and computation? Well, uh, in one of her letters, um, written from Constantinople, uh, she describes to a friend a system of floriography uh, which is a kind of cryptography that uses um, plants and flowers to communicate particular you know, hidden messages. So I'll turn to that letter here. It appears at the very beginning of this volume, and she provides first a table of all of the names of flowers um, and then their corresponding messages. So just for example, um, you know, the pear, uh, pear flower, maybe a branch with flowering uh, pairs on it would, would mean give me some hope, um, or a rose uh, means may you be pleased and your sorrows mine. So all these sort of sentimental, uh, emotional communications uh, that you could use in place of writing a letter, for example. Uh, but she writes to a friend, um, and she actually, this is a, an interpretation of a bouquet of flowers that she sent to a friend. And she ends up by saying, you see this letter is all in verse, and I can assure you there is as much fancy shown in the choice of them as in the most studied expressions of our letters. There being, I believe, a million of verses designed for this use. And this is the important part. She says, there is no color, no flower, no weed, no fruit, herb, pebble, or feather that has not a verse belonging to it. And you may quarrel, reproach, or send letters of passion, friendship, or civility, or even of news without ever inking your fingers. Um, so it's this really complex system of communication that uses only botanical specimens, I think is fascinating in its own right. Um, but I would argue that this is uh, an example of a cryptographic system that really has a place in this collection, um, given that we have, you know, for instance, uh, two Enigma machines, right, really important cryptographic devices um, from the mid 20th century. Um, so a bit of a departure, but nevertheless, part of these same histories, part of these same stories that I hope the collection will end up telling in a really compelling and full way. This next book I'm actually really excited about. It's the most recent acquisition. I purchased it just last month for the collection from an antiquarian bookseller based in New York City who specializes specifically in Asian uh, books uh, and Asian science, Japanese and Chinese science mainly. Um, so it's in three volumes. Um, this is very typical uh, of the Japanese book from this period. This was printed uh, in 1808. Um, it's actually, uh, the title of it is Karakuri Zui, which means a compendium or catalog or list of interesting machines. Um, 
And what it describes actually are what we would recognize as robots um, or early sort of mechanical puppetry uh, that Japanese culture at this time in particular was really fascinated by and had made great strides in developing really complex uh, systems for, mechanical systems for. Um, so I'm no, by no means an expert, um, I don't read Japanese, um, but this period in Japanese history I think is utterly fascinating. Um, so as I said, 1808, um, but throughout the Edo period, um, so sort of 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, um, access to Japan by European powers was limited and severely restricted. Um, and so, and I think the Dutch mainly were the only kind of European culture that had regular mercantile access to uh, the Edo court. Um, and what happened is that there was some cultural exchange um, and that led to a sort of curiosity on the part of Japanese scientists, mathematicians, in kind of Western innovations and Western science. Um, and that led to this phenomenon or field of study uh, that's known as Japanese as Rangaku. Uh, and Ran is a, trans a shortened form of the transliteration for Holland, so Oranda, uh, and Gaku meaning studies. So literally it means Dutch studies, um, which is I think just totally fascinating as a cultural phenomenon. Uh, but more broadly, it just, it, it, it labels um, Japanese cultures um, interaction with an interest in Western um, technologies and Western science and culture. Um, so this book is very much a product of that movement. Um, you know, famously, the Edo kind of restriction on Western books was lifted in 1720. So you get this, you know, more or less a flood, I and mean, it wasn't really a flood, but you got more books coming into Japan from the West, and therefore, you know, the, the brilliant scientists in, in Japan at the time read it closely and started thinking along the same lines and taking you know western science in new uh, directions um, so as i said this is this book is a product of that that phenomenon um, and the the author whose name was hosokawa hanzo yorinao uh, was a mathematician uh, calendar expert um, he died in 1796 when the first edition of this book appeared this is the second edition uh, printed in 1808, so a little bit after he had died. Um, but when you leaf through, uh, I just want you to kind of look at the illustrations because this book is absolutely beautiful graphically. Um, and you can see that each page um, describes a particular um, device. Um, and karakuri uh, is still a, a word that's used in modern Japanese. Um, it, it can mean a robot, um, but it can also mean like a trick or something that conceals um, its inner workings, its operations. So this is very much in play when you look at these illustrations. Um, but I, I love the, the, just the graphic um, simplicity of these illustrations. They're so clear. And I think the reason for that, and you can see that each component is very carefully labeled. The reason for that is that Hosokawa, the, the author, wanted these illustrations to function as a kind of graphic instruction manual for building these kinds of machines. Um, and as, as I leaf through, you can see like each illustration, there's sort of an isometric clarity to them. They're, they're three-dimensional. You can see how the various components of each device interact. And a lot of these devices, um, you know, they're anthropomorphic, so they, they have figures, I mean, here, um, there's a sort of tumbler acrobat figure um, who sort of leaps from platform to platform, um, powered by springs. Um, but the, they, they run the gamut in complexity. So he describes things like clocks, right, that are designed to tell time uh, according to the Japanese system of timekeeping, which is different from our own, or which was different from our own, um, all the way to kind of um, anthropomorphic uh, figures that would write, for example, so there would be a small figure that could dip, dip a brush uh, into ink and then write Japanese characters. Um, but, the, but the theme, I think, throughout is really this fascination and almost this reveling in the aesthetics of machinery. Um, and I think you get that sense of joy and fascination um, and, and, and interest in and finding a way to explain these devices in as clear a way as possible.
I mean, all three volumes um, are copiously illustrated. Um, I'll, I'll weave through another one here. Uh, there's another device that shows a fish that can swim up a stream. Um, my guess is that that actually was a functioning fountain. There was water in it. Um, that device shows some sort of pulley, um, system of cog wheels. And some of the more, you know, graphic representations like this one here is just a spiral. Um, I think that shows um, sort of the mechanical properties that were at work in some of these devices. Um, there's a musician. So just, just a stunning book uh, in every way um, and so different from what we have in the collection. I mean, I think in a previous installation, I had shared um, a early book on Chinese mathematics and computation, which was uh, one of the first to describe the operation of the abacus. Um, and that's really something that I'm invested in and interested in because you know, so, for, for so long, institutions that are collecting the history of science in particular have focused um, almost exclusively on the history of Western science and mathematics and computation. Um, but of course, as we know, those histories are cross-cultural. Um, and I think this uh, shows us how that fascination in machinery, that fascination in devices and technology uh, really is a human impulse. It's not unique to the West um, or to European culture, surely. So this is just you know one, one step in that direction. I will say too that this is a major acquisition for CMU because no other copy that I've been able to, to find of this book is held in the United States. So we are the only institution, the only library to have this particular edition in our collection. Um, so that's, you know, it's exciting for me. Uh, and again, it just shows, you know, how we're really taking strides in the libraries to build a special collections that's unique uh, and speaks to all these stories. So this last thing I'll share actually is, isn't an individual book or object. It's a collection of books. Uh, and they were all owned at one time by Alan Newell, who was a professor at CMU, uh, won the Turing Award with Herb Simon, and famously with Herb Simon and Cliff Shaw, uh, programmed the Logic Theorist, which is recognized as the first um, artificial intelligence computer program. And that was in 1956. Um, so when Alan Newell died in 1992, uh, he and his widow, Noelle Newell, uh, gave his library to the university and the books in that library were basically put into circulation so they could be checked out and consulted by students, which is a fantastic um, you know, benefaction and legacy uh, for Alan Newell to leave as, as a teacher and as a researcher and as such an important part of CMU. Um, but one project that I've been working on is actually reconstituting his library and transferring it to special collections because as you might imagine you know Alan Newell I think is just starting to um, assume a place of real importance in the history of artificial intelligence I mean, it's always been important but I think as people start to recognize that artificial intelligence has a history of its own uh, it's important to retain uh, Alan Newell's library for uh, posterity uh, and for future researchers who might be interested in thinking through Alan Newell's thought. Um, what was he reading? What, what, what influences can we see in his, uh, his own work that are coming out of his reading, out of his library? Um, so the collection, it's several hundred volumes. Um, he was a voracious reader uh, and he gave the entirety of his collection um, kind of in two parts um, to the university. Um, unfortunately, this is a question that people always ask, you know, did he write in his books? Are there annotations? Are there sort of observations that he made? Unfortunately, he was a very meticulous uh, reader and part of that meticulousness extended to his choice never, apparently, to annotate his books. So we really don't have records of his thought in these books. But nevertheless, I would, I would make the case that just having the books together on a shelf uh, is a representation of his thought because it shows us what he was buying, what kinds of thinkers he was engaging with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I have some examples here um, from his collection 
um, you know, his is a, a draft, so pre-publication draft of Ray Kurzweil's The Age of Intelligent Machines, which was an exhibition actually that Kurzweil um, curated. Uh, and this is a book that he compiled and wrote for that exhibition, uh, but kind of an important uh, moment in uh, the 20th century, realizing that uh, the computer was indeed going to be very important uh, for the future of humanity. This was published or prepared in 1988. I think it could, uh, appeared in full in 1990. Uh, but this is a copy of the draft that was in Alan Newell's library. Uh, we also have a copy of the first edition, first official printing of this book uh, in Alan Newell's library that's inscribed uh, to Newell by Kurzweil. Um, but that's, I think that's just an interesting example of how Newell, even as late as 1988, he died in 1992, um, how he was really engaged in ongoing debates about um, the place of artificial intelligence and its future. Um, but, you know, just in point of contrast, um, Alan Newell, um, you know, he came to CMU to study under Herb Simon. He was a graduate student of Simon, um, unfortunately predeceased him. Um, but one of the first things that he did that really brought him to Simon's attention uh, was to describe a computer program that was capable of playing chess. Um, and that, that's really um, an ongoing uh, or sustaining current in Newell's thought uh, in the 1950s and 60s. He was, he was fascinated by games and game theory. So, you know, again, for example, you have these two books. You have Puzzles in Crypt Arithmetic and 150 Ways to Play Solitaire. So, you know, th these weren't just academic sort of dry publications that Newell was using in his own work. He has all kinds of material in this collection that, again, shows the breadth and depth of his learning and reading at the time. And I love this uh, book on solitaire because um, actually, um, it's page 42, you have um, a torn piece of a punched card that would have been used um, in computation. It's a blank, so it wasn't punched. And then you have in Alan Newell's handwriting the name of a particular game you can play with a deck of cards and with a page reference number, page 41. Um, so I, I love that as an artifact sort of of Alan Newell's um, thinking and uh, uh, an artifact of his interest in game play. Um, so, like I said, it's a huge collection. I have just started to scratch the surface of it, and I really hope that you know maybe a graduate student uh, would take this collection on as even a dissertation project, because there's a lot there um, to examine. Um, but I, I wanted to share this other thing that has to do with Alan Newell. This is a book that wasn't in his personal collection. It was actually in the circulating collection of Hunt Library. Um, and I was looking at it for another reason, um, and I'll share what it is first. So it's the preparation of programs for an electronic digital computer. Um, it's by a British uh, mathematician, computer scientist named Marius Wilkes. Um, and this book, it's important because it's recognized as the first kind of textbook on the subject of computer programming. So important, a lot of early students who studied computer science in the 50s probably would have been assigned this book. Um, as sort of an introductory text. Um, but um, so I, I, I transferred it to Special Collections because it is quite rare in its own right and important. But when I brought it to Special Collections, I looked at the back. And um, a lot of you will recognize this. This is just um, you know, a loan record of when the book was borrowed, when it was due. Um, these are more recent stamps. But in this, this envelope here, there's um, another slip um, recording loans. And if you look, you see about halfway down, A. Newell, Alan Newell. Uh, and the due date is November 27th, 1956. Um, and that blew me away. I mean, that's, that's, in my opinion, phenomenally cool because we know that Alan Newell, at about this time, was working on The Logic Theorist with Herb Simon and Cliff Shaw. And both um, Newell and Simon freely admitted that they were not computer scientists. They leaned pretty heavily on Cliff Shaw, who was really the, the computer scientist of the three. Um, so I think it's really interesting that you know, maybe Alan Newell felt that he needed to br brush up on his you know, computer programming skills as he was working alongside Cliff Shaw. Um, so he maybe would have borrowed this to, to do just that. Um, again, you know, th this is a point that I often make that 
books contain kind of a record of our thought, a record of thinking, and that's certainly the case with Alan Newell. Um, I'll say too that in Special Collections we have Herb Simon's library. It's not as extensive, it's not as large, uh, but both of those collections, as, as I say, really show um, how early, early artificial intelligence sort of gestated in both of these men's reading and in their libraries. Uh, and I think there's a lot of fascinating work to be done. Um, so again, that, that kind of work can happen in special collections. That's really the objective of a robust um, acquisitions policy. That's why we're growing the collection. Uh, and that's why I try to make all the things in the collection as accessible and available as possible. Thank you for joining us tonight for this inside look into what I do as curator of special collections. I also want to say thank you as well uh, to the entire community because so many of you have given to special collections and that kind of support, uh, philanthropy but also smaller donations, uh, really allows us to pursue an ambitious and robust acquisitions program which allows us to grow the collection, uh, which in turn allows us to invite uh, an increasing number of students and researchers and member of members of the public into the collection. So thank you so much for that and I look forward to your uh, questions uh, just in a minute. Well, thank you, Sam. That was another wonderful episode of Fine and Rare. Uh, guests, please do please do submit your questions using the, the chat function. We will collate those. We'll try to get through a few in the remaining time. And if there are particular points of follow up, we will be in touch. Uh, one immediate question I will knock off was, uh, where can people see earlier episodes of Fine and Rare? Those are all part of the Carnegie Mellon University Library's YouTube channel, and we will provide a link to you through the chat. I was really struck by your um, point about the um, checkout date of the book that Alan Newell had borrowed, because I'm conscious now, I was just checking that indeed, the Dartmouth Conference, which was the, the first event on artificial intelligence, took place in the summer of 1956. 11 leading thinkers um, attended that workshop, one of whom was Alan Newell. And I almost wonder whether he came away from the workshop and thought, yeah, I need to brush up a bit on my coding. Uh, so Sam, we've had a number of questions coming in already. I'm going to work backwards. Um, oh, there was another question there. I'll just answer that, which is, will we make this recording available? Yes, that will join the others on our YouTube channel. So on the, the Japanese book, two questions. Uh, do you have any insights into what technology was used to print the book? You know, was it movable type? Was it brushwork? Was it something else? And yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a great question. Um, Sorry, Keith, I didn't mean to cut you off. If you're going to read the go question, for it, go for it. Um, yeah, it's it's entirely in woodcut, um, which you know it's different from Western printing in that Western print shops from Gutenberg on used individual metal pieces of type, um, each of which carried a raised letter that would be inked and then leave an impression on paper. Um, which isn't to say that. That technology didn't exist in Asia. In fact, uh, we now know that the earliest movable type printing was done in Korea, I think in the 14th century. So about a century before Gutenberg. Um, but most Japanese books, yeah, were were printed using woodcut. So you they would cut a, a full block of wood with the Japanese characters and the illustration all on one piece of wood, and then press the paper onto um, that inked surface to take the image. Um, and I, I mentioned this in the video, I'm not, I'm not an expert in Eastern um, printing technologies. I'm learning more every day. Um, but there's something I, I would probably make the case that just the style uh, and complexity of Japanese characters and writing systems kind of lend themselves more to woodcut um, printing. Um, that said, there is there is one thing that I've noticed in that book, having looked at it more closely in the last few days, like on the title page, and I wish I had it here to hold it up to the camera, but on the title page, there's a woodcut frame, kind of decorative frame, which is kind of embodied or, inha or inhabited with little Western um, 
devices and that the frame itself looks very western in style so there's all there's obviously this dialogue going on um, between you know japanese bookmakers and western you know european publishers um, so i think you start to see that influence in how the books were actually being printed in japan at the time and vice versa right obviously there was a huge fascination um, in the netherlands and, and in northern europe and southern europe in japanese culture and art um yeah but woodcuts to keep it short uh, and another question about that that same um, printing. Um, do you have or can we obtain and make available a translation of the text, obviously, into English? Yes, um, I, <laughs> I'll admit that I did some experimenting with, uh, you know, Google Translate's camera function. So I was just pointing it at some of the pages to see how accurate or the translation would be. And it was, I was pretty surprised. I was pretty impressed. But there's actually a Japanese scholar that has issued a full, you know, front cover to back cover translation and study of this book in particular. Um, that's unusual. You know, a lot of the a lot of these early scientific books from the East in particular have not been translated into Western languages. Um, but I think that's that just reflects the importance of this particular title. It, it really was the very first book to treat robotics in Japanese. And so I think because of that, it's gotten a lot of attention from Western scholars. Um, but yeah, I can I can find if you Amazon or Google, you know, translation of Karakuri Tsui, uh, it should come up. I'm forgetting the name of the scholar right now, but it's out there. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, another question, very very different one, one that I know you will be very pleased to talk about. Um, you, your process of working with antiquarian booksellers, how, how does that unfold, and how has that evolved in recent times? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. It's in many ways the, my, the favorite part of my job. You know, it's a lot of fun um, in part because before I, before I came to CMU, before I started the PhD at University of Virginia, I actually worked for an antiquarian bookseller who was based in London. So I made a lot of connections while I worked in the trade. Um, I know which sellers are reputable, which sellers specialize in, you know, areas of focus for us at CMU. So it's a lot of fun to cultivate those connections and share, you know, what we're collecting so that they bring things to my attention that I might want to buy. Of course, you know, they 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 have a motive behind that, but uh, it's, it's it's definitely a collaboration. And I've found that booksellers are incredibly knowledgeable. They're scholars in in their own right. So. Um, I've really enjoyed leaning on that expertise uh, and keeping, you know, one foot in that world. Um, yeah, but we, you know, we, I mentioned uh, the bookseller who sold us that Japanese book, but we also occasionally purchase things at auction. Um, there's a phenomenal sale of books going on right now at Christie's in New York. I think it closes on the 2nd of February. Um, but so we, we, I just keep track of those things. I, I spend a certain part of most of my days looking, uh, glancing through uh, booksellers' catalogs and seeing if there's anything out there that we might want to acquire and target. Great. A couple of quick questions, one for you, one for me, and then um, one final question before we, we close things down. The one I'll, I'll take quickly. Um, I mentioned the Burns statue, and I was asked where exactly is it? If you were facing the front door of Phipps Conservatory and turned left and walked around to the left-hand side of the complex on Panther Hollow Road, you will see a large imposing statue um, sculpted by Massey Rinder, a famous Scottish sculptor. Um, so I will leave that with you and encourage you to to go and have a look at the statue. It, it really is quite striking. Um, equivalent one for you, Sam, what is the piece of art or etching behind you as you talk to us this evening? Yeah, it's um, it's a facsimile. It's not the original, but and it's fairly massive. It's about six feet across. It's the it's a map of Rome that was published, I think, in 1748. I'm going to have to glance at that. But yeah, the, the name of the designer, the cartographer is Noli, N-O-L-L-I. And so it's Rome as it as it looked in the 1740s. Uh, it's a really spectacular image. It's fun, fun as a backdrop for Zoom. So a final question. Uh, many people that, that I talk to in, in the profession and, and members of our community at large are surprised by just how rich special collections at Carnegie Mellon are. And I wonder if you could just say a few words about why that is. 
Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful question. Um, you, you know, I think the the story of special collections at CMU is in large measure the story of Pittsburgh because you know so that the excellence of the collection really is a result of philanthropy, and that just goes back to how many how much wealth there was in the city, and how many collectors and how many people you know really in the in the twentieth century were invested in returning the wealth that they had generated in the city of Pittsburgh to cultural organizations in the city and the region. Um, so, you know, I, I usually just list a few names uh, that go along with that story. So I'm in Hunt Library right now, and uh, it's named for Rachel, Rachel McMaster's Miller Hunt, uh, who was married to Roy, Roy Hunt, who's chairman of Alcoa, you know, Mellon Company. Um, she was a major collector of botanical books. And I think someone in the chat mentioned the Hunt Institute and actually someone mentioned Charlotte Tanson. And yes, she's still upstairs. She's amazing, Chuck Tanson. Um, so that's upstairs. When, when Rachel Hunt, uh, when she was nearing the end of her life, um, she had this, she had formed this really phenomenal kind of first in its class collection of rare botanical literature. And she was looking for an institutional home for it. And eventually it came to CMU. They funded the construction of Hunt Library. Um, and really, unfortunately, she passed away right when the Hunt Institute kind of got up off its its got up onto its feet and got going. Um, and there was a lot of books that remained in her collection. And so those books, which were rare and important, but not necessarily botanical, came to form kind of the, the nucleus of special collections at CMU. And that was like 1963, 1964. Um, so from there, that really, I think, gave other potential donors um, the opportunity to give to that collection to grow it. Um, and so, you know, another major name, Charles Rosenblum, um, who's another Pittsburgh philanthropist, um, you know, worked in finance. Uh, he was a trustee of the university. He gave a large part of his collection to CMU. Uh, if you saw the previous installment of Fine and Rare, I've shared all of the, or no, two, two installments ago, I shared all of the Shakespeare folios. So famously, Charles Rosenblum, uh, the Charles Rosenblum gift included the copy of Shakespeare's first folio that we have in the collection. Um, really just phenomenal works of literature, mainly. Um, lots of first editions by Dickens, uh, Darwin, uh, Whitman, you know, major names kind of in the Western canon. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, he passed away in 1973, I believe. Shortly after that, um, the Posner Memorial Collection came to the university. And um, Henry Posner Sr., you know, you start to see rhymes and, and repetitions in these stories, but another really successful Pittsburgher kind of entrepreneur. And in the last decades of his career and life, he collected uh, pretty widely uh, books and he ended up focusing in the history of technology. Um, so his collection, it's kind of similarly second to none, uh, you know, first editions of all the major figures, Newton, uh, you know, Galileo, Copernicus, et cetera. Uh, but that came, you know, again in 1976, I believe. So um, I'm, I'm kind of rambling on, but you, you see what I'm, I'm getting at. It's, it's really the excellence of the collection reflects that generosity and that really, you know, large scale um, philanthropy. Um, but of course, I, I should I should end by saying that we also receive smaller donations, and a lot of the things that I shared tonight, uh, recent acquisitions, you know, were purchased with that kind of support too. You know, it all it all counts, and I just feel so fortunate that I'm able to carry that legacy and carry that trust into building a collection at CMU. Well. Sam, thank you for a wonderful evening, a wonderful presentation, and for your time in the Q&A session. Thanks to our audience for joining us. Again, your support of Special Collections is invaluable, and we would not be able to maintain such a diverse and meaningful programme without your engagement. Uh, if you enjoyed this event, please consider supporting Sam's work with the gift to the Special Collections Acquisition Fund. Uh, your donations, as Sam just mentioned, make possible transformative exhibitions, research, and other programs that bring students, scholars, and members of the public into special collections and into CMU's libraries. 
Let me close by mentioning the next event coming up at the University Libraries, our annual three-minute thesis competition. If you're curious about what groundbreaking research and discovery is happening at Carnegie Mellon this year, 3MT is your chance to hear doctoral students explain the key points of their work. They are limited to a maximum time of three minutes and they must present to a non-specialist general audience. This year, all seven colleges are participating in this interdisciplinary event and our finals will be on Thursday, March the 14th at 6 p.m. We'll be streaming that online. We will be in on the university campus, um, I believe in the auditorium in the Tepper School of Business building. We hope to see you there. With that, thank you again and have a wonderful evening.